I want justice, as I recall, that said wanted, dead or alive. A price was put on Osama bin Laden's head in the aftermath of the attacks of September 11, 2001. To this day, the Al-Qaeda leader is still not in American hands. To understand how the most wanted man managed to slip through the net, we decided to retrace his steps. Jalalabad, Afghanistan. For years, this city of one million inhabitants was the stronghold of Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda organization. Two years after the fall of the Taliban, it is the men of Commander Massoud, assassinated by the Islamists, who control a large part of the country. But women continue to wear the burqa. Islamist ideology is still present, and television cameras are still not welcome. It was here that Osama bin Ladina was last seen. A month after the September 11th attacks, he had gathered Afghan tribal chiefs to urge them to resist American attacks. The Al-Qaeda leader had set up one of his most important training camps in Jalalabad. Today, this camp serves as a base for the Afghan army. We are allowed to film. Before being driven out by American bombing, Terrorists from all over the world came here to learn about jihad, the holy war. French Al-Qaeda fighters trained here, like Jamel Loiseau and Brahim Yadel. This former lieutenant of Commandant Masouda fought alongside the Americans to drive out bin Laden's men in November 2001. This was Osama's and the Arabs' camp. The Americans bombed from this side and that side. We attacked through this place. Everything was destroyed. Osama's men were training in these hills opposite. This training camp was the pride of Al-Qaeda, which liked to broadcast these propaganda images. At the time, bin Laden -si was shown with his general staff and bodyguards. He also showed children being initiated into the holy war and terrorists trained in explosives and the art of guerrilla warfare. Two years after bin Laden's flight, only vestiges of this era remain. An ammunition depot with a few rockets and a container used as a prison. Written in Egyptian Arabic, it still reads, don't worry, we like the color of blood. Bin Laden often gathered his men on this terrace facing the lake. It was undoubtedly here that the attack on the World Trade Center towers was decided. It was here that Osama bin Laden se gathered with his men. This is also where they made important decisions. Above all, it was here that most of the 9-11 hijackers were trained. We managed to recover an Al-Qaeda propaganda document, some of whose images have never been broadcast. They clearly show the presence in Afghanistan of the terrorists who struck the Manhattan Towers. The man training with the machine gun is Saeed Al-Ghamdi. Among the 19 hijackers, here is this 22-year-old Saudi. He was on board the United Airlines flight that crashed in Pennsylvania. The film also shows, for the first time, three other hijackers gathered in a house somewhere in Afghanistan. These three men were on board the planes that exploded on American soil. Hamza Al Gamdi, 25 years old. He was on the Boeing that crashed into the South Tower. Walid Al Sheri, 27. They were both on the plane that crashed into the North Tower. Ahmed Al Nami, 23. He was on the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. A recorded voice explains that all these hijackers are together in this house to plan the September 11th attacks. 
Their goal to destroy America, that modern-day tyrant. These men were not 19 military powers. They were just 19 fighters. On this military base in Jalalabad, bin Laden had the frapped strength of a warlord. They even had tanks, now recovered by his enemies. Commander Massoud's men, who make up the Northern Alliance. We head for downtown Jalalabad. At the hotel, we meet the interpreter who will take us to Tora Bora, the mountains that two years ago protected the escape of bin Laden and 300 of his men. In this hotel, guests are asked to leave their weapons in the check room. Our interpreter is the man on the right. We met him by chance. We don't know if we can trust him, but we have no choice. He's the only guide who speaks English. First, he takes us to see Commandant Ajaka, who is responsible for security in Jalalabad and the surrounding area. This commander has taken part in all the battles against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. To go to Tora Bora, we need his authorization. Tell them that their presence is important. We're responsible for their safety. Jalalabad is very popular, but it's a very dangerous city. If anything bad happens to them, it will be a disgrace for us all. The commander suggested that his men accompany us to ensure our safety. Again, it's hard to refuse. But the looks on their faces aren't very encouraging. The road to the mountains is long and dangerous. Bandits and terrorists often ambush us. An hour's drive from Jalalabad is Bin Laden's house, a palace if we are to believe the Afghans who visited it. The Al-Qaeda leader had these buildings built. American bombing has turned them into ruins. The men who are supposed to ensure our security are not in a normal state. From the start, they've been smoking cannabis. Clearly their minds are elsewhere. We set off again. But very soon a puncture forces us to stop. At the time, we had no idea what was going on around us. It's when we get back to Paris after translation that we understand that these men are thinking about how to eliminate us. How to eliminate us. Ask if we do it now or if we wait. No, we wait. I want to do it now. No, wait. I want to smash his head under the car. <laughs> he's close to the vehicle, but he's quiet. Careful, they're Arabs. <laughs> Is that one an Arab? Yes. And who's the other one? The other one's a Frenchman. The hostility of these men is easy to explain. Their former leader, Commander Massoud, was assassinated by these Arab terrorists who posed as journalists. Perhaps our bodyguards will take revenge by getting rid of us. For the moment, we don't understand what they're saying, but we sense that the atmosphere is tense. With the wheel repaired, we set off in search of bin Laden. One of us is in the cab of the pickup, the other in the back filming the landscape. One of the men points the barrel of his Kalashnikov at us. The camera turns and records a surprising dialogue between the two militiamen. Who are you talking about, about him? Yes, I'm talking about him. Why get into trouble? And what are you going to do with the corpse? Obviously, for the moment, they've given up on their project. We've reached the foot of the Tora Bora Mountains. Coming from Jalalabad, Bin Laden and 300 of his men followed this route all the way to here and split into two groups. The bulk of the troops took the relatively passable left-hand road. They were exterminated by American bombing raids. Bin Laden, his staff and his bodyguards took the right-hand route, 
which was chaotic and winding, but much more discreet, by sacrificing some of his men, bin Laden managed to evade American reconnaissance planes and bombers. The route taken by the Al-Qaeda leader was indeed very difficult. At the pass above 2,000 meters, it was impossible to proceed, even with an all-terrain vehicle. According to several eyewitness accounts, bin Laden and his men also had to abandon their vehicle at this point to continue on foot. Suddenly, one of our militiamen called out Osama bin Laden's name. Osama bin Laden? Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden. Osama. This is the treatment these men dream of inflicting on bin Laden and his followers. The behavior of our escorts remains disturbing. We catch our translator on the left of the screen, waving to a militiaman and pointing to one of us circled in red. He approaches a bullet to his forehead and mimes an execution. But the two men realize we're filming them. They act as if nothing had happened. A few minutes later, a call from Commander Hajib Shah, the man we met in Jalalabad. How are things up there? I'm doing fine, sir. Listen carefully, you've got to make it easy for them. Don't worry, I'm tired, but I'm doing it for you. I don't want to hear you complaining. You've got to help them. That's an order. This call will save our lives. The militiamen continue to smoke cannabis, but give up their project. Commandant. We're in the heart of the famous Tora Bora Mountains. This is where bin Laden set up his headquarters two months after the September 11th attacks. The place is strategic. From here, we dominate the entire region and within rifle range of neighboring Pakistan. Pakistan, where Al-Qaeda has many allies. Bin Laden knows this region well. He spent time there during the war against the Soviets. In particular, he knows the caves of Tora Bora, which have always served as shelters for local warriors. There's nothing extraordinary about these caves. There are around 20 of them in all, both natural and man-made. When bin Laden took refuge here, the US Army explained with pictures that the caves were multi-story bunkers built under the mountain. Built under the mountain, and that only specially designed bombs could destroy them. Propaganda images more akin to spy films. Images far removed from reality. All we found on site were simple caves. A few square meters without the slightest comfort, each capable of housing a dozen men or stockpiles of ammunition. A few weapons still bear witness to the passage of Al-Qaeda troops. In December 2001, the U.S. Army and Massoud's men launched a major offensive on Tora Barab to dislodge bin Laden and his men. American aircraft dropped tons of bombs. Tanks and infantrymen finished the job on the ground. The battle lasts several weeks. The group leader accompanying us took part in the fighting alongside the Americans. How many dead are here? Osama was there. He commanded the entire battle of Tora Bora. Many people were taken prisoner, but most of the fighters fled. The Al-Qaeda men were dislodged, but once again, bin Laden managed to elude the Americans. After a 12-hour trek, the Saudi billionaire and a hundred or so of his men 
despite being surrounded by the Americans, managed to find their way through the mountains and into Pakistan, a country where bin Laden has many supporters. They arrived in small groups at Parachinar, the first village on Pakistani territory. According to several accounts, bin Laden and his men split up to take refuge in different parts of Pakistan. Officially, the Americans lost track of him at this point. The year was January 2002. Since then, bin Laden has been reported in several major Pakistani cities. Karachi, the economic capital of Pakistan, one of the largest cities in the world, 17 million inhabitants crowded together. The ideal place to go unnoticed amidst the crowds. Bin Laden's presence in Karachi was reported by the US intelligence services in early 2002. Since the September 11th attacks, Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf has been reassuring Westerners that his country is genuinely fighting terrorism. But in reality, the most radical Islamists operate with complete freedom in Pakistan. Karachi is a well-known Islamist stronghold, and foreign media are not welcome. It was here in January 2002 that an American journalist, Daniel Pearl, was kidnapped and had his throat slit in an unsolved incident. It was also here, in May 2002, that 11 French engineers were killed in an attack outside the Sheraton Hotel. Lastly, a car bomb attack on the American consulate killed 12 people and wounded 100 others in June 2002. Since then, the American consulate has been transformed into a fortress. As soon as we arrived at our hotel, we were surprised to witness an unusual ballet. First, we receive a visit from a Pakistani who introduces himself as a businessman and claims to want to help us. Obviously, he's a Secret Service agent. Trying to find out more about our intentions, we film him on hidden camera. It's very dangerous, it's very dangerous here. You can move without informing us, but if you do, no one will be responsible for your safety or your life. Nobody can make take a responsibility of uh, your life. The message is clear. If anything happens to us, we only have ourselves to blame. Back in our rooms, another visitor is announced. This time, it's a member of the French intelligence services. I'm sorry to disturb you, but please take a seat. The hidden camera starts rolling again. You are from Karachi, aren't you? Yes. Before you, someone else passed by and didn't get a chance to do his story. Daniel Paul. You know him? Yes. He worked in much the same way as you. He tried to obtain information about terrorism, certain jihadist groups and so on. It didn't work out. So you're going to get into a sensitive area. Very sensitive. Everything is known. 17 million inhabitants, but everything is known. Here, yeah, everything is known. Within a few hours, all the spies are aware of our presence, and it's not over yet. The parade continues. This time, the Pakistani police are waiting for us in the lobby. Have a seat for you. Hi, thank you. Hello. You'll need an escort. Is that a problem? We have no problem with that. With, uh, with uniform? Uniformed? Yes. So it's with an official and not very discreet escort that we'll have to continue our investigation in Karachi. First stop, a residential area of the city. This is where one of Bin Laden's men was arrested on September 11, 2002. Coincidentally, one year to the day after the attacks on American soil. Ramzi Ben Sheba. This 31-year-old Yemeni had been designated by bin Laden to be the 20s hijacker, but for lack of a visa, he was unable to enter the United States. Ben Sheba had been living for several months with accomplices on the top floor of this building. The Pakistani secret services knew it, but preferred to ignore it. It was only after strong American pressure that they decided to arrest him. The neighbors had no idea that Islamic terrorists were hiding in the building. 
He was clean shaven with a short beard. When we saw them, we thought they were nice people. They were dressed in Western style with jeans and sometimes leather jackets. The arrest of bin Laden's men had caused damage to the apartment. A year later, the Pakistani authorities are trying to erase all traces of this damage. Despite this arrest, dozens of other terrorists roam freely around the city. We arranged to meet one of them, against all odds. He agreed to come to our hotel, even though it was infested with intelligence informers and closely watched by the police. This man is the spokesman for Laska e Taiba, an organization blacklisted by the Americans as a terrorist group, an organization responsible for attacks in India and still in contact with Osama bin Laden. Officially, Laskar e Taiba has been banned by President Musharraf. This does not prevent its members from continuing their activities openly. The spokesman for this organization is the man in the center of the picture. He doesn't know we're filming him. Does Musharraf consider you to be terrorists? Yes. Then why is this man walking around freely? He's even sitting next to a Pakistani army officer here on the right. There are a few training camps in Pakistan in the Kashmir region, but they're secret. Mujahideen come here to train for suicide operations. The Quran teaches us to wage jihad against Jews and crusaders because they are our enemies. This is the usual line of Muslim fundamentalists. This has been the case ever since a fatwa designated Westerners as the main target of the holy war, the jihad. The fatwa was issued in Karachi's main mosque, the famous Binori town mosque. It's Friday, the day of prayer. We enter with our hidden camera. The Imam's preaching is a little clearer. Listen carefully to this speech. It's not really a message of peace. Leaving the mosque, an unusual situation. To the left of the screen, the police a few meters away. Men from a terrorist organization close to Al-Qaeda. They are collecting money for jihad in full view of everyone. The Binori town mosque is not just a place of prayer. The intelligence services know that it houses members of Al-Qaeda and regularly issues calls for murder. This sanctuary of terrorism is run by a powerful and dangerous man, the Mufti Nizamuddin Shamzai, bin Laden's spiritual father. It was he who trained the Taliban leaders in the 1990s with the support of the Pakistani secret services and the blessing of the CIA. It was he who issued the most terrible fatwa ever issued against the West. This was in 1998. It incited Islamists to kill Jews and Crusaders, and Americans in particular. We asked to meet the Mufti. This man is Pakistan's highest religious authority. He is a kind of Pope of fundamentalism. This religious leader is very protected. You can't get close without a search. Everything is checked, bag, guide. Fortunately, he doesn't notice the hidden camera. He welcomes us into his home. But despite the smiles, the atmosphere remains tense. He meets few journalists and, like all Islamists, hates cameras. He refuses to be filmed. No, no, you can't film. You can't film. To put him at ease, we speak to him in Arabic and make him believe we're Islamists making a propaganda film for bin Laden. 
As a result, he's less suspicious. May I film? Yes, go ahead. But before answering, the Mufti realizes that the door is open. Women's voices can be heard. For Islamists, women's voices are a source of sin. He gets up and closes the door. Double locked. First, he agrees to explain why he launched his fatwa against Westerners. Theologians have issued a fatwa against those who have attacked and injured Muslims. For example, in Palestine. They also issued a fatwa for jihad against the Americans. In 1998, this fatwa received strong support. Osama bin Laden signed the document and with other terrorist leaders created the World Front for Jihad against Jews and Crusaders. I was one of those who signed the fatwa for jihad. For years I've been inciting Muslims to holy war. It's a fatwa to which many people have responded. Since then, bloody attacks have taken place all over the world. The security services are convinced that Mufti Nizamuddin is still in contact with bin Laden. We put the question to him. Despite his embarrassment, he tries to joke his way out of it. My house is in front of you. There is neither Mullah Omar ni Osama bin Laden, nor the last of the so-called terrorists. My house is in front of you. President Musharraf recently asserted that bin Laden was alive and that he was in Pakistan. He is indeed alive, thank God. That is the truth. I'm sorry, do you have any information on this? I don't have any information, but I'm convinced he's alive. Are you convinced or do you know? You'll have to make do with what I've just told you. We're convinced he's alive, but not in Pakistan. America can't find out where he is. How should I know? We don't have American technology. But he's closer to you than to the Americans. The Americans are his enemies, you're not. It's true that he's a Muslim and we like him a lot. And as I said before, he's alive, thank God. But he's not in Pakistan. Would he be in Afghanistan, for example? We can't say exactly where he is. But he's alive. The Mufti is categorical. Bin Laden is alive. But he won't say any more. His mosque has another special feature. It houses a Quranic university which trains the Taliban and shapes the ideology of terrorists from all over the world. We're not welcome here. We're not allowed to film. On the other hand, they agree to let us in. The hidden camera is rolling. We are received by the son of the Mufti Nizamuddin. He's just been released from prison. The Americans had arrested him in Afghanistan. We learned that 10 French nationals are currently training here. We'd like to meet them. The students will come and talk to you. Are the French coming too? Yes, there are French, Ethiopians and Algerians. In the end, the French don't show up. It's a Briton, a Somalian and an Ethiopian who come to see us. Still no French. And yet once again, we're told they're here. What, other nationalities, what nationalities from Europe are here? From Europe. From, Europe, from Europe, there are the French. I met some French students. Can we meet them? Can we meet some French or not? Our interlocutor turns to his boss. Our insistence is disturbing. The answer is no. We won't be seeing the French. The reason they give is that they fear their families. 
would have problems in France with the police. We are allowed to have a look around this very closed madrasa. Here, students are subjected to indoctrination. For them, we're just miscreants. That's why they avoid looking at us. In front of us, young people, many young people, among them, no doubt, would be terrorists. We leave Karachi convinced that bin Laden is still alive and that he has many supporters in the city. But at the end of 2002, the Al-Qaeda leader's presence had been reported in another Pakistani city, Quetta, 600 kilometers to the north, a large town close to Afghanistan. Quetta is a place where Taliban and Al-Qaeda members have taken refuge after the American offensive. We're going to try to meet them. Here too, a man close to bin Laden, wanted by the Americans, has been arrested. Abdul Rahman Yassin, an Egyptian suspected of managing Al-Qaeda's finances. The arrest took place last year in this downtown house. The man had been living there for several months, communicating with his colleagues through the internet from these cyber cafes. These communications enabled the Americans to locate him and request his arrest from the Pakistani authorities. In Quetta, the Taliban are welcome. They have their own mosque, their own neighborhood and control various Quranic schools in the city. One of these schools is run by a Taliban who recently arrived from Afghanistan. According to our information, the man is close to Mullah Omar. Equipped with the hidden camera, we ask to meet him. He's a young man. His name is Mahmoud and he agrees to meet us. On the wall, an inscription that says it all. Had you been in Afghanistan before? Yes, in Kandahar and Kabul. Kabul. Do you have any problems now? No, no problems at all. As far as the Arabs are concerned, they're well protected in the tribal areas and in many other places. Do you think Mullah Omar et Osama bin Laden are well? Inshallah, they're fine. All is well. You know, today all the Taliban, the last of the Taliban, is an Osama and a Mullah Omar. We're asking to film the pupils of this Quranic school. In Pakistan, many parents refuse to send their children to schools run by the Taliban. They have a reputation for abusing the young boys in their care. Strangely enough, the class that day was about sex. Convinced that we don't understand, the Taliban's speech is astonishing. Lesson number 16. If men put something on their sex, for example, oil or cream, if it gets into the hole of their penis, it doesn't cancel Ramadan. You see, it's just like the Taliban. Strange words from a religion teacher addressing children under the age of 10. And that's not all. This time the teacher talks about women. Clearly this is a matter of great concern to him. If a woman crosses in front of you and you see a part of her body, a very special part of her, you may imagine something sexual and ejaculate. You can carry on with your Ramadan. So the Taliban are not tough. That's how it goes with the Taliban. That's the way it is with the Taliban, and it doesn't need any comment. All this doesn't stop them from devoting themselves to the essential, teaching hatred and encouraging children to take up arms. Here we also train future generations of terrorists. Are you Mujahideens? Yes. Who is a Mujahid? Who among you are those who fight in the path of God? We are those who fight in the path of God. So you're all Mujahideen? Yes? They said yes. Yes. 
There are 35,000 schools like this in Pakistan. A few hundred meters from the madrasa, the Islamist flag flies over the headquarters of Pakistan's main religious party. The town's spiritual leader is a very important figure in the fundamentalist world, Muhammad Noor, a personal friend and political advisor to Mullah Omar, leader of the Taliban. For him, the jihad is not just aimed at the Americans. Americans and their allies are all in danger. Do you include France among America's allies? They're all miscreants. France is not with us, nor with Muslims. France is not fighting the Americans. But killing French people in Pakistan is not allowed. And is killing French people in France allowed or not? The French are not Muslims. And their laws are contrary to Islamic laws. It is permitted to kill all those who fight against Islam and all those whose lawis are contrary to the laws of Islam. This religious leader is one of those who have contacts with Mullah Omar and probably also with bin Laden. President Musharraf has been saying for some months that Sheikh Osama bin Laden is alive. We don't know where Sheikh Osama is. But do you think he's alive? His friends say he's alive. Who are his friends? His friends are the Taliban and Mullah Omar. He's alive too. Mullah Mohammed Noor will say no more, but he has made no secret of the fact that the terrorist threat is as present as ever. A few arrests of Al-Qaeda members have not made it disappear. Bin Laden has not yet lost the battle. But the Al-Qaeda leader's presence has been reported in another city, Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan. This is where the centers of Pakistani power are located. It was here that just a few months ago, in March 2003, he was arrested. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the organization's number three. Officially, this arrest took place in Rawalpindi, a suburb of the capital that has been transformed into a military garrison. This is the nerve center of the Pakistani army. Even the secret service buildings are located here. It's hard to imagine that an Al-Qaeda leader would have taken the risk of taking refuge in this district without the assurance of not being bothered. All the more so as the Pakistani and American authorities have obviously lied about this affair. Officially, Al-Qaeda's number three was arrested in this house, inhabited by a wealthy Pakistani family, the Abdul Qadus family. We went to see the inhabitants of this house. This man is said to be the one who hid the terrorist leader. His name is Ahmed Kadus, but obviously he didn't understand what had happened to him. Have you been interrogated? Yeah, a bit. What was the question? And, uh, about uh, this, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, Osama, uh, or what, uh, no, what was Khalid, uh, and, uh, and uh, about my family and uh, this and uh, that. And who else do you know? I don't know. I said I don't know nothing. Do you know who they were looking for? They, that is what I heard from them. I don't know who uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is or any other person. You didn't know Sheikh Mohammed? I don't know anyone. Did and you I, heard this name before the police asked read, you? No. You have nothing to do with Al-Qaeda? No. You have nothing to do with terrorism? No. According to our information, Al-Qaeda's number three was hiding in the house of a Pakistani intelligence officer. At the time, he even had frequent contact with Osama bin Laden. We are seeking to confirm this very serious information, which once again highlights the double game played by the Pakistani regime. 
We ask the guided to obtain an appointment with an important intelligence officer. The same day a colonel was ready to meet us, but off camera, we go to meet him. I said maybe we should... We're on our way. Because we are In this area, the camera must be turned off. We enter a military zone, the hidden camera rolling. The colonel is waiting for us at his home. He lives in an area reserved for army officers. He holds a senior position in the Secret Service. This man is a specialist in terrorism. To record in the best possible conditions, we simulate a coughing fit so that he stops the ventilator. First, he confirms that the authorities lied about the whereabouts of Al-Qaeda's number three. I'm talking about this Al-Qaeda leader. Maybe he wasn't arrested here. And I'm even sure that he was arrested elsewhere. It's true that it's not all that clear. Before his arrest, Al-Qaeda's number three was indeed protected for a time by the Pakistani secret services. The colonel also confirms an important piece of information. Osama bin Laden may be hiding in Pakistan. Pakistan has not many areas where our regular forces can't go. And these areas are known as tribal areas. And these are created by Britishers, not by Pakistan. If there is a remote possibility, then Osama bin Laden is hiding in tribal areas. No wonder. In fact, the Pakistani secret services have had close links with bin Laden for over 20 years. Let's take a look at another Pakistani dignitary who has also always supported the Islamists. General Hamid Gul. He used to be head of the secret services. He has known bin Laden for a long time and is considered one of his main allies in Pakistan. The man is no longer active, but he remains influential. Have you ever met uh, Osama bin Laden? Yes, I met him and uh, twice, in, once in 1993 in Sudan and second time again in Sudan in 1994. What kind of person is he? I found him to be a rather shy, sensitive, intelligent human being. Do you accept to the jihad is uh, consider considered like terrorist? No, jihad is not. It's very noble. It is to be fought within a defiance like the liberation movement. In Pakistan, regime dignitaries defend fundamentalist theses. This partly explains why the country has never really engaged in the fight against terrorism. The secret services fund all the religious parties. In fact, the spokesman for these religious parties is this man. His name is Maulana Fazalu Rehman, and we have an appointment with him. By a happy coincidence, we arrive in the middle of a conclave. Here, there are only close friends of Bin Laden and Mullah Omar, the finest ideologues of international terrorism. As usual, they don't like cameras. Among them, of course, is Nizamuddin, the Mufti of the Binori Town Mosque in Karachi, the man who issued the fatwa that bloodied the world. Religious people who even have a sense of humor. As we arrived, Fazalur Rehman quipped in the Mufti's direction. Do you know Mufti Nizamuddin? You know he's a dangerous man. We've seen that he's dangerous. Do you know that he belongs to Al-Qaeda? Fazalur Rehman has just told us that Mufti Nizamuddin is a member of Al-Qaeda. Take a good look at his expression at that moment. His face betrays a certain embarrassment. When we question him, Maulana Fazalu Rehman is no longer joking. He remains on the defensive and barely responds. First of all, we don't know what Al-Qaeda is. What is Al-Qaeda? We've been presented with an abstract fate accompli. We've never come across anyone who says they belong to Al-Qaeda. Fazalu Rehman claims he doesn't really know what Al-Qaeda is. However, two years earlier, in October 2001, 
he was haranguing the crowds and urging them to support bin Laden. That day, he didn't hesitate to call on his supporters to wage jihad. The demonstration took place in Peshawar near the border with Afghanistan, a city where bin Laden's presence was reported a few months ago. Peshawar, the city of shadows. Here, for several months now, religious parties have been imposing Islamic law, Sharia, as in Kabul in the days of the Taliban. Women must wear the burqa when they go out. Music is banned and the streets belong to the men. The people we met for this survey told us that bin Laden is alive and well, and that he is directing his operations from a safe haven on the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Jamal Ismail is a former journalist with Al Jazeera, the television channel of the Emirate of Qatar. He met bin Laden 20 years ago and is known to have conducted interviews with the terrorist leader. He even met him recently. When and where did you last meet bin Laden? I'm sorry, but I can't answer that question. The journalist is discreet but agrees to give us a few clues. All his movements are shrouded in secrecy, and no one can know whether he's here or there. It is possible that he is based in the tribal areas on the Pakistani side. My conviction is that most of these tribes consider that protecting bin Laden is an honor for them. They see him as the fighter and hero of Islam who defied American tyranny. Bin Laden is therefore believed to be in the tribal areas. This information confirms that which we have gathered throughout this investigation. The tribal areas, a lawless zone, a region of Pakistan where the police and army are not allowed to enter. There are six tribal areas on the border with Afghanistan. The tribes manufacture their own weapons and set their own laws. The shops are full of weapons and ammunition. Here to be unarmed is to be unmanly. These tribes are often at war with each other and respect a code of honor that's hard to decipher. Foreigners who enter clandestinely are either kidnapped or at best extorted. The ideal place to hide. Al-Qaeda members are said to be based in a very special region of the tribal areas, Waziristan. It is here, among his own people, that bin Laden is said to have found refuge, even if he does occasionally emerge from his lair. In Peshawar, we meet Islamists from Waziristan. They are unaware that we are filming them and confirm the presence of Al-Qaeda troops in the area. Against US there are a lot of Al-Qaeda members in your area. They go back and forth between Pakistan and Afghanistan. They come here to stock up. Listen, it's the Pakistani border guards who allow them to go and fight against the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. There are a lot of Arabs in Waziristan. They're not afraid of anything. They risk nothing. They hang out in the markets, everyone sees them. The Arabs he's talking about are the ones who are now bin Laden's bodyguards. If they're in Waziristan, bin Laden must be there too. We have not obtained permission to go to Waziristan and foreigners are forbidden to enter the region. Passes have to be granted by tribal chiefs and the Pakistani authorities. In recent months, no more passes have been issued as if there was something or someone to hide. It is uh, prohibited for foreigners to visit there and very specially for journalists because uh, uh, that was the, the area Al-Qaeda people and uh, some says uh, Osama bin Laden uh, was crossing the border uh, through that way. Nevertheless, our two guides agreed to take us. It's a five-hour drive from Peshawar to the Waziristan border, and there are many roadblocks along the way. We ask our guides to present us as tourists. The first roadblocks went through without a hitch. 
Thanks to our beards, they don't identify us as foreigners, and our cameras are discreet. But a few kilometers further on, another roadblock, and then we have to stop. We're at the gateway to Waziristan. Representatives of the local tribe control the passage. Our guide will try to negotiate with them. Can you give us permission to go further? There's no problem. You can go. This time it's okay. But the tribesmen stare at us with great suspicion. Ten kilometers further on, another stop. Once again, our guide tries to get permission to pass. We film discreetly from the car. In the distance, in the barracks, the militiamen are cleaning their weapons. This time things get complicated. The guide returns accompanied by a guard. Tension mounts. The tribesmen are nervous and our guides are worried. We're in danger of being arrested. People cannot go beyond the, uh, than this uh, check post. It is forbidden. Yes, we must uh, went back. What's the big deal? My bosses are going to give me a hard time if I let you film from the other side. You have to understand. No more filming. Can't go any further. It's August 5th, 2003, and our route ends here, in the tribal areas near the village of Omar Kel. A few kilometers from here, trails climb up the mountainside. We're about 50 kilometers from the Afghan border. This is where Osama bin Laden is believed to be. Do the Americans and Pakistanis not know? And if not, what are they waiting for to go and arrest him? A sign from the White House or perhaps the right moment? Time will tell. A month after the end of our investigation, the Pakistani army and American special troops surrounded Waziristan, where our route had stopped. They even launched an initial offensive against the Al-Qaeda men, killing 12 of them. But on September 10, 2003, almost two years to the day after the attacks in New York and Washington, Osama bin Laden appeared on a tape broadcast on television around the world. Once again, he threatens the West. 